All right, welcome back to Hanging Out Podcast. I think officially back from the dead. Still minus one bear. We're going to stop saying that after this. Plus one Bruce. I'm Alan Mars. We're hanging out with Joanna Barnum, who you might know from her uh, fantastically uh, creepy but enchanting paintings or her convention appearances. Congratulations, Joanna. You've made it. That's what it is. Thanks. Finally <laughs> made it in life. That's what the podcast. This, yeah, this podcast. Yeah. This is the peak of, of this is our the threshold. You can uh, well, thank you. Glad to be here. Yeah. Thanks for, for joining us. The uh, I've, I've uh, loved your work for a long time. And so it's, it's an honor, but oh, also I, I sort of called you out on the last show. <laughs> yeah. yeah uh, I was, um, I was listening and I did not expect to hear myself mentioned. I was kind of delighted, actually, although, but then I felt sort of compelled to, um, to leave a comment, um, to, to defend myself a little bit at well, how you kind of, <laughs> I'm glad you did because I, I, I sort of went off the cuff, uh, jumping off whatever tangent we were on then. And I even got your name wrong at first because I'm terrible with names. Just, I, I went to school with a Joanna Sabine. And so it just kind of comes up first in my memory, but, uh. Um, yeah, but I actually um, thought that, like, the point that you were making, that sometimes there are specific things at a convention that you think make a huge difference, but you haven't really, like, tested it. Mm. Uh, like, you just believe that a specific thing really matters. Like, I thought that that was kind of an interesting point um, in general, because I've had that thought before about certain aspects of, a, a you know, <clears throat> how to display things or what you're doing. Right. Convention, well, I... urban legends. <laughs> I think there was a big wave years ago of people who, because the old school comic guys, I mean, you know, 10, 20 years ago, you go to a convention and it's everybody. I mean, they still do it, even the big names, uh, partly because they don't have to stand up or say anything. They're just sitting around drawing and, and making a lot of money, I think. Uh, but then there's a big wave of people like doing sales techniques, standing up, being, you know, talking to people more readily. Uh, the, the salesmanship of it really blew up. So it's really interesting whenever I walked up to you at Gen Con and I think some people walked up while I was there and, and I kind of stood to the side like I'll do, uh, so, you know, so you could do your spiel and you just said hey to them and you didn't stand up. And I was like, um, yeah, well, so <laughs> I'm no, I'm, I'm definitely don't believe that you should ignore people. Like, I think that you should be alert and available for them. Like, I don't, I think that it is probably discouraging to people if like you have your head in a sketchbook and you just don't acknowledge them at all. Mm -hmm. um, mainly the, the thing that I have an issue with is that I think that it has that the fact that you have to be standing specifically, I think is like an urban legend, as long as you have a display where like you can be seen, right? Like, so if you build your display so tall that you can't be seen and you're hidden behind it, obviously that's not going to work. But like, if you build it so that you have a place to sit, I think you can sit and be alert and say hey to people. Um, I don't really have a spiel. Um, I'm not a great talker. Um, and that's something that I have thought about, like, trying to get better at as far as um, sales go. But um, honestly, I've put more, like, to compensate, I think I put more effort into other areas. And over time, I'm not sure it, it has mattered. Or maybe just different people, you know, sort of put their focus in different areas. Like, maybe, if you know, if you're better at, talking salesmanship maybe certain aspects of your display are not as important um and i feel like i've sort of gone in the other direction um because i'm not a great salesperson but i've really thought about having my display you know speak for me as much as possible um but i do say hi to people i, I don't like i try not to ignore <laughs> them i hope i didn't ignore people when we were talking that day um, no i don't I, think you did that's not what i'm trying to say but it I, counts Hey, counts, and you did make eye contact. I think you probably said more than "hey." Um, but there's a there's that. a good point in there about min maxing for any mm -hmm. kind of activity, not just for for conventions, right? Like, you know, compensating for areas where you're you're weaker is definitely a, a good strategy because in order to fully min max a an exhibitor table like there's just so much that you'd have to do and it's not to say that you won't continue to get better at the salesmanship part and that that won't have some kind of impact but you do have to balance it against okay like how much energy do i want to put into this right now in order to get a certain return right 
Like, I feel like there are only so many things you can focus on improving at one time. Mm. Well, and you also said that maybe you weren't a good salesman, and I'd, I'd uh, disagree with that by your, your say. You know, you're just a salesman in a different way. Mm. Um, yeah, okay. Yeah. Well, you control your um, space and, and that I do. sells yeah. it for you. So. Yeah, I'm not, a, I'm not a great, like, verbal salesperson right like mm -hmm. some people are really great at that the sort of patter of like um making it making a sale verbally um and i am i'm not great at that um you know i think i have gotten a little better of at it over time um but like i don't have um scripts um and i don't have really like i don't have stories about my pieces um sort of like pre-written stories i know some people have like gone that direction mm -hmm. But I do think I've gotten a little better at figuring out when people want to hear more about a piece or when they to kind of get sensing when they might need more help or they might need, you know, something offered to them um, and that they just need that way in to start the conversation. Um, but then there are also a lot of people who really just want to be left alone. Like when I'm shopping, I kind of prefer to be left alone until I have a specific question and then I want somebody to be available to ask them that question i don't mm -hmm. want them to be like ignoring me because then it's hard for me to get i'm shy and it's hard for me to get their attention so like i want to be able to easily like make eye contact with them but if they're like looming over me or really like if i feel like they're pressuring me or like they have high expectations i'll just like run away because it's too much <laughs> pressure <laughs> the, the uh yeah, that's definitely a sixth sense that you grow is about. I remember my first conventions, I was, you know, you're on pins and needles, like you've, you've kind of got a spiel rehearse, or at least I did. And I was just throwing it out to everybody, trying to be smiling and excited right. and all that. And you're on pins and needles about whether people want it. And at, at my most recent show, it just wasn't a worry at all because you do pick up on what other, uh, what potential customers might expect from you, whether they're just walking by or, or things like that. And it just, you know, the worry goes away there. Um, and there's definitely an aspect as you as you continue on and you have maybe less pressure on each individual sale, which allows you to kind of like back your, your energy and presence yeah. off a bit and let some of those folks who are going to be bothered by it um, actually just interact with the, the art and then interact with you when they're ready. Well, I had an interesting um, talking about you know, setting things up where you could sit down. My, much like Bruce's setup, I, I don't build it around sitting down at all. I mean, I basically built, you know, the wall of prints that <laughs> yeah. if I'm sitting, and I'm shorter. You can't see me if I sit down, but, and I, I could, you know, and I might have to eventually with things like, you know, Bruce has his magic card binder and he's, he could be sitting down signing now. And that's something he yeah. had to do. Now, but... now the setup had to change to necessitate a signing area and an artist proof area so there is a designated area that is um low <laughs> low, low density i guess um so people mm -hmm. can definitely find me there more easily but i used to do a a wall of vertical and, and horizontal prints that you know could be kind of a barrier um well and i mean uh, part of my my reasoning um as well as that i think you have to kind of be kind to yourself in the in the long haul and that the events are long they're long days and it's days upon days and like the floor is not always great and like you might bring your little anti-fatigue mat to stand on but like i always hear people you know complaining oh my back is killing me my feet are killing me and i still got to keep standing up and it's like if you want to keep doing the the events you know you don't want to like injure yourself or you don't right. want to unnecessarily like torture yourself because if you're miserable like that's not going to be um making for a good sales experience to people either mm -hmm. yeah um yeah i uh we had an issue where our, our car got broken into on the last thing i mentioned that oh, to you no, yeah and, uh, the so i was on the phone dealing with that and i didn't want to be yeah it's weird i didn't want to be standing up on the phone that almost seemed ruder than me you know tucking back into the booth sitting down so i, I was sitting down i was on the phone i was focused talking to the, the valet manager and all that and uh when i was done with the call you know you could kind of see people behind the wall of, of screen of uh, prints and i wasn't really paying attention but when i was done with the call i stood up and there were no kidding like eight people waiting to buy things from me oh wow and well that's nice that they waited 
Well, it also made me think like, oh, maybe I'm doing the opposite I should have. You know, if if I had been standing up, <laughs> would they still be there? I'm sure they would have. But uh, no, it's just interesting you know, to sort of prove your point there is, is you don't uh, you don't always have to to be standing up selling like I often do. Right. If people love something, right, they they might go that extra mile. Probably what you weren't seeing when you were standing up there are like the twice as many people who <laughs> walked by or, or you know, mm-hmm. casually perused and kept on going. Um, and I think that the more the art, you know, I've got my statue ster- series I'm doing. And I, th- I think this is probably something that because uh, Joanna, don't get me wrong, you don't do a ton of um the commission work like illustration commission work uh i'm open to it when the right stuff comes along and there are um you know i i I would like to do a little more but it's sort of like it has to be the right fit i know i'm not sort of the easiest fit for a lot of the opportunities um out there um and i've done you know i i do personal commission work as well like i'm always open to it um but it has to make sense you're probably more familiar with this. I have been doing more personal, you know, leaning toward finer art work uh, than my commission stuff. And these days, it feels more like any explanation I give kind of gets in between them falling in mm. love with the painting. Do you do you ever get that? Um, I think that um, I usually try to leave room for to give the explanation to the people who seem to want to know more. Um, because some people really want to know, like, well, what did it mean to you? Or like, what's your story behind it? Or how did you make it? Or why did you make it? Right. And then, then that's the way in for them to connect to it. But then in other cases, I think maybe you're right that people bring their own thing to it and they don't, you don't want to tell them that they're wrong, right. About like what it means, Mm -hmm. um, that they may, they may just have their own story that they want to bring to it. Yeah, I nothing's worse than saying, you know, what a painting might be about, and and then they're them going, oh, okay, and then leaving, and then they walk on. Yeah, like, I didn't know it, that. See you later. Yeah, <laughs> it's not the thing that I was hoping. <laughs> but yeah, I talked about you uh, controlling your space, and and that's something else that happened to me is I, I somebody said, uh, oh, you're bringing, you know, I have my my uh, what do you call them, pro panels that I bring to my shows, and and. That's really rare to see, I think, at a lot of the the artist alley, like Comic Con artist alley, uh, that kind of setup. And somebody came, another exhibitor came up, and they said, "Oh, you brought the gallery with you." And I was <laughs> like, oh, "I get, yeah, that's a really good way to put it." But all I have are are pro panels, and you really bring the gallery with you. I'm I'm constantly enthralled by your setup, and it, you oh you did well, thank you. I mean, I can I can um, I can pull up an image if you want me to uh, share. Um, and I feel like it's, my setup is actually not that, um, not that complicated, but, um, I've tried to kind of fine tune things over time. It's complicated for me because I'm not a fabrics person at all. So yeah, we can show them. Um, so that's, um, that's Dragon Con, Hmm. this past, this past Dragon Con. So I had a, a more of a booth space to work with there. Um, so those are my pro panels. Um, Mm -hmm. at Gen Con, I use, I use theirs and my extenders. Um, I can, um, that's a similar one at an oddity show. And I am looking for my navigation, which I cannot find. Yeah. The Uh, thing I'm trying to, um, get to Gen Con. Okay. Here we go. There we go. All right. Yeah. That was that mm-hmm. was this past Gen Con. So, you know, there they they provide the pro panels. Um, but I like the I like the pro panels, so I you know, that's what I use at other shows. I have my own. Um They're classy. Uh, and um so fabrics, you were like I don't know about fabrics. Um so well, the, just sorry, go on. The thing I love most is I think you you it's hard to tell from this picture, but you did your own print displays and signage yeah. at some point. Um, so the um, the print board, actually, I've had that pretty much since the the beginning of like the first uh, convention I did a few years ago. 
because I had looked at, like I had done a lot of research and I had looked at a lot of people's displays and I kind I understood like, you, well, you need to have a display of the prints out in front of um, people. And I was just kind of thinking about different ways that people did that and, and what looked nice and what didn't look nice and um, how to, just how to make it look stylish. Mm. Um, I wanted to show the actual print. I didn't want the print to have to be behind plastic in the display um because i wanted to show the quality of the print mm -hmm. um and then i just so then i was thinking well, okay well then how can i display like a paper print on something um and so i just i just designed these boards that are just um they're foam core with fabric hot glued around them like a suede um fake like micro suede kind of uh fabric in gray um because i've sort of picked gray silver metallic accents um as sort of like my neutral classy neutral that i like to use in my display um and so then it's three three separate foam core panels um the one on the front of the table has ribbons that sort of it, it stabilizes by that go back across the top of the table and get clamped down um, and then the one that stands up just sits in like folding, um, folding like book, book holders. Um, and then because it's a little too heavy for them, I ended up putting like a yardstick across the book holders and clamping the yardstick down. So if you look at, I don't have a picture of it from behind, but like, if you look at it from behind, it's what my husband likes to call hobo engineering, where it is very, um, it is, um, very ramshackle uh where you can't see it but surprisingly stable um and um i i like the way it looks it's a little bit of a pain to transport like you certainly couldn't fly with that i drive right. i drive with it but it's still a bit of a pain um the other thing i don't love about it is that it's not um that modular uh and so each year i end up kind of redoing it with the prints I want to focus on and I sort of mm. I've I'm, I've considered changing it to something else a little bit where it might be easier to swap designs right. in and out um and like we were talking about like sitting versus standing like well oh but does it matter um you know I've wondered to myself like it's a nice print display but but does that display matter versus you know how what it seems to be common that a lot of people do is that they just have like their bagged prints in like a tiered display. And I'm like, I love showing the print because I think it shows the quality Likewise, of the yeah. print. It's easier to see it. Um, but does it matter? Because I know people who make, you know, great sales and that, and they don't display their prints like this. So um, I don't know, you know, I'm afraid to change it. <laughs> <laughs> right. There's a, when you, that's what keeps me from, I didn't know those were hot glued. I, for some reason, I thought they were just, like stitched around the thing. I don't know why. No, it's just hot glue. Like pull it tight and hot hot glue it. Um, and then the um, prints themselves are like the uh, like tape runner, like two double sided tape from like a tape runner. Mm -hmm. And then I also have like little decorative um, frame plaque. I don't know what, what like they would be on like a um, like, like an old filing tool. cabinet or something um the, with the right, titles right just as like a decorative element um and like i've tried to carry sort of that intentionality into like my signage as well and like the tablecloths that i use um well i remember last time we would you call it crushed micro velvet uh, yeah so Wait. either micro suede um or crushed vet like crushed stretch velvet actually works really well as a tablecloth too because it doesn't um wrinkle right um but really even like what i have now um isn't isn't that texture on the tablecloths but it is a stretchy apparel fabric it is not a tablecloth mm. and i because i've noticed that like the stretch fabrics um don't when you put them on the table, don't tend to look wrinkled. They tend to mm. let go of the wrinkles. Um, Cause that is like, like, that's a pet peeve, right? Like I think about like these little details when I look at a display and the tablecloth is all wrinkled to hell. Um, I think it looks really bad. Wrinkles, wrinkles really bother me. 
I don't know. Um, the, I'm not basing artists on like whether their things have <laughs> wrinkles. I, I don't do that. But for some reason, personally, I just, I don't know. Um, and again, it's like, I don't know, you know, if there are just things that I hone in on that a customer is not necessarily going to notice, but maybe I feel like on a subconscious level, like my thing is when it comes to your display speaking for you, um, if you want to charge the prices that you want to charge, um, you know, higher end prices on things, if you want to sell originals, um, or if you want to make more sales in general, if you want the collector to value it then you have to present it like you also value it. So that means like not having a random crumpled up handwritten sign or having like a, like a sticky flea market looking price tag, like stuck to a frame. Mm -hmm. Like that you, um, you're going to ask over $500 for, yeah, that's what I do for, for my master prints behind me that if, if you're going to ask for that, you need to dress and not just dress, but dress your booth uh to fit that uh, it's like um, a nice restaurant you know definitely yeah, an area yeah, where i need like, some what, improvement <laughs> what would a you know what would a high-end gallery do right like they have or a museum like they have printed wall labels it's not like written with a sharpie on a like thing you'd see at a flea market um and i mean and then you can also think about like what vibe goes with your work stylistically um and I, th you know, that's a way to sort of like carry your, your theme and your identity through the What's display that? and it, you know, it takes a little extra work, but it doesn't take that much extra work to make, you know, nice printed signs and make yeah, sure your stuff. One of my favorite sales quotes is by Seth Godin, um, who constantly repeats that like the core of advertising is people like me like things like this or the core, mm. core of selling, which is, you know, you can't. Um, you, it's very difficult to try and make a person, a different personality for yourself as a salesman. It comes off as, as almost a, a, a big mask, a big lie. And it's like people can tell. And so I, I always think about that, you know, make the booth or the presentation as much to something I would enjoy as possible. Not what I'm thinking other people might enjoy. And I think it'll draw in because I make the art for myself you know, to an extent uh, and it'll draw in the other people that, that like the things that I like. Um, I think that's, yeah, I think it's the same. I mean, I think it's the same about the work itself and, and you know, how you, how you present it. Bruce, I don't think you need to work on that at all. I think you're doing pretty well. <laughs> I, I don't know. Well, I'm doing fine business wise, but it is it is an area for improvement because I do have um, a number of things where it's kind of MacGyvered together and not just behind the scenes ramshackle, but like there's there's definitely like I could upgrade my signage to look a little fancier, a little nicer, a little little plaque type stuff, you know, and as you say, it wouldn't wouldn't be that much additional work it just would be some additional work when i'm at home and often not thinking about conventions so i just have to remember it at the right time to to do with it um, maybe did... you'd make even more money i don't i don't know i mean that's that's but like I... you said it doesn't seem like you need it but it's yeah it goes goes back to the comment about min maxing right like how much do you want to min max and how much do you have to right, in order to accomplish your particular goals. Um, you know, it might eke out some additional profit, but until I do it, I don't know how much more and whether that's worth it to me when I'm balancing so many other things. Um, I was curious about the displays since they're like this hot glued fabric and stuff, and you're saying that you were replacing stuff or, or kind of redoing them on the regular. Um, but I'm curious about like, cleaning caring or you know whether that just becomes replacing every once in a while because that kind of thing you know if, if someone spills some stuff on your um, um display I've been, well i've been pretty lucky so far that nobody has spilled anything on them um people do have a weird tendency to want to lean on them sometimes which makes mm -hmm. me nuts because it, uh, it yeah. doesn't look to me like it like why would you look at that and think it's a load-bearing thing that you should lean on right um and so shockingly they've been surprisingly durable 
like no, but nobody's uh, broken them. Mm -hmm. um, so when I change the prints, I can just kind of peel them off and okay. re like stick down. So I'm not necessarily redoing the whole thing. I haven't had to rebuild the entire um, structure. It's it's I'm shocked that it's actually lasted this long. Um, when I transport them, I made them their own bags out of like heavy drop, like plastic drop cloth fabric. Mm -hmm. um, I like just sort of taped it together into like custom bags with um, pockets that they slide into so that they're protected when I'm traveling. And then they it like rolls down at the mm. top. So like moisture can't get in. Um, so, so far so good. I have always had this fear of like getting to the show and something terrible has happened to them. Like it's like the whole thing is like snapped in half so far, so far, so far it's been fine. Um, have you had the, uh, have you had the old, uh, somebody sitting a drink on your stuff yet? <laughs> Uh, not on the print display. Um, I have put, have seen them put it like on the table cloth. Um, uh, most, mostly I haven't, shockingly, I haven't had anything really terrible happen. The, the strangest thing that happened to me at, at an oddity show I was at is that there, um, a woman walked up eating a powdered cannoli mm -hmm. uh, and she was, she got like very close to the table. She didn't put it over the table, but she's there and she's gesticulating with it. Like while she's talking and I'm like, I'm just like, ma'am, I'm so sorry, but like that cannoli is making me so nervous. Can you please not step, step back around. with it? She's like, Oh, of course. Like she wasn't a jerk yeah. about it. Um, I also once had somebody pick up one of my books and go, oh, I love how books smell. And before I watched it oh, her, no. before I could say anything, she put like her entire face, like in the, like she rubbed her nose, like all oh, over the inside of the book. <laughs> um, you know, once in a blue moon, kids make me nervous. Kids you know, if they're, if they're not being watched, sometimes kids try to like peel stuff off the display. Mm. Um, or even like customers, it's interesting what people are used to at different shows, because I feel like at the big conventions, there are certain standards that customers have seen. They understand how a print board works. They understand like how a sample display of something works. Um, whereas if you go to um, a show that's a little less like that, sometimes people, I'm surprised at what people don't quite understand. Like I've had people try to like reach and like pull a pin like off the display mm -hmm. board. Like they don't understand that it's like a display. Right. Um, that happens, that's kind of uh, rare, but when I run out of cards all the time, I'll, I'll tape my cards down and I, I have a black cloth. So, and I use black tape, so it looks nice, but then, you know, every once in a while somebody comes and, and like pulls the card too hard and it makes me really nervous. Um, but I could just not have cards like some people. <laughs> Um, I do. I have, I have cards. I know I've definitely heard people say that they don't, they don't do business cards. Um, but, and I, I go through a lot of them, but I, I feel like they're cheap enough. Yeah. They're cheap enough to where I just, I don't mind it. You know, I'll go through what well, the last one I did roughly, I want to say I had 400 cards probably just left my table. And I know 90% of those, I watch the people they they just pick them up and they leave and, uh, it's fine. You know. like having signage that people can take a picture of in, in lieu of a card. But I also do have some cards because sometimes you need it. Um, anytime I'm doing a pre-order, for example, I give them a card. So I've got their contact information. They've got mine. We've got potentially two-way communication if we need it. So, I mean, cards right. fulfill a purpose, but it is nice to have um, an alternative that can yeah. either lessen the amount of cards that you're sending out there um, or if you run out of cards, you've got an, uh, a plan B that people I are just as happy with. Having both is nice. Like I think having mm -hmm. a sign or a QR, um, plus the cards, cause some people don't want paper stuff to take with them. Um, right. but then some people do. So I want to have it for sure. however, somebody might want to remember me and the cards are cheap enough that, um, if it results even in just a couple sales down the line, I mean, it pays for the it's worth it. for the cards. Right. Um, Sarah's my wife. Uh, her company just got into uh, conventions and they printed cards. Well, they didn't print, you know, she's a salesperson. She's got her own extension 
all that, but they didn't print cards for her. And the reasoning they gave was that the cards were too expensive because all they did was order the Moo cards. Mm. And uh, so you've got this multi-million dollar company and they're like, yeah, but the cards are too expensive because we went with the most <laughs> expensive version. <laughs> right. Um, anyway. Uh, yeah. So I met you at your first show. I remember it distinctly. Because yeah. You were just um, I think, in the gallery. Yeah. I mean, I guess technically um, I would say my first actual shows were um, Aluxcons. So I had been to uh, I IX Aluxcon um and done the uh showcase. Mm. Um I think uh yeah, I had done that prior to that. So I'd been to IX a couple times, which was sort of my my personal um launch point to the like current era of my mm -hmm. career, which also has a period of time before that. Um so I wasn't like a new artist, but I was sort of relaunching myself and refiguring things out at that time. Um, so I, so I had done IX, but then I had kept hearing about, you know, Dragon Con and Gen Con. Um, and I actually, I, what I ended up doing is the thing that, you know, <laughs> new artists are kind of advised not to do, but I'm like, what are the best shows? Gen Con and Dragon Con? Okay. I'm going to go do this. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go scale Mount Everest. <laughs> um, and um, to be fair, I, and then I, to be fair, I'd had, you know, 10 years of a career before I started trying to do this, this genre of um, convention. So I wasn't totally like, you know, and I was like, I want to do these shows to um, also invest in like, representing myself and if i go and i try if i can get in and i can do them and i can go and try them even if i don't make money at first i can afford to do that um so let's see um but uh but yeah that dragon con i did do um before i had a booth um or a table at dragon con i went i went uh in uh 2018 i think it was um back when you could still do just a gallery wall and like a print shop that they ran for you. Cause I'm like, well, let me try that first. Uh, and so I did that. Um, and that was like my first big con, I guess, but not, not having a table. Oh. Um, I, I didn't really sell anything <laughs> via their old system of like not mm -hmm. having your own table, but I did get to walk around a whole lot and look at other people's displays and um, meet people and like talk to artists because there were periods of time when there weren't, you know, crowds of customers and so i think that yeah that is when i i met you because i had nothing to do besides like walk around the art show and chat with people i don't know how you how you ever came by my booth twice the art show's massive how'd you ever make it from one end to the other <laughs> <laughs> you yes, spent a whole ballroom <laughs> i couldn't imagine spending so much time just wandering around the art show and talking to people i would i don't know I and mean, you were but you're very uh you know, you, you came up, you said, hi, you introduced yourself, and uh, it was, you're very easy to talk to, so it worked out. Oh, well, thanks. Um, I'm not um, naturally an outgoing person, but I've tried, you know, through the years, um, especially in the sort of current incarnation of my career, um, is I think when I started to understand that um, it is networking, and not, I mean, not to put like a, a, a networking is like such a cold term, but like mm. having friends, like right. having artist friends um, who are trying to do the same thing that you are and seeing what they're doing and learning from them that it's, it's so necessary um, because Crucial. the first, the first part of my career, I think I got out of art school and I, I had, I guess it was just a mentality of coming out of school of like eyes on your own test paper where I felt like I didn't, and I was intimidated too. Like, I didn't really want to know what other people were doing. Um, cause it just felt like it felt weirdly competitive. Um, mm. uh, and I guess different, you know, different art communities have different tones too. Right. Not everybody is, is generous with 100%. information. And I feel like the fantasy art community in particular is, um, extremely generous and, and open, um, which I, which I really appreciate. Um, you know, not every community is like that. We're very um, fortunate. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I've just learned over time, like, okay, you have to go, you have to go meet the other people and 
that's how things happen. And that's also how you, how you learn things. You don't have to invent the wheel on your own, which I feel like is how I spent a lot of the early part of my career, mm -hmm. thinking that I had to figure everything out, like from the ground up on my own, rather than learning from other people. There's a bit of a benefit there though, right? Because, and, and I'm not saying that everyone should try and reinvent the wheel, but I think that in doing that, you, uh, one of my first thoughts when I saw your work was that it was different than a lot of the work that was normally at Dragon Con at the time. You know, it was, I think it's changed and it probably started to change long before I started going. I'm not a, you know, I'm not a veteran of Dragon Con, but um, it wasn't, you know, your work's not standard fantasy fair uh, or illustration fair. And I remember thinking, oh, I don't know how she's going to do in the gallery. Uh, I don't know if this is the place for that kind of stuff. And I, I hope it is, but I don't know. And, you know, I think part of that, it, when I was starting to come up in illustration, I, I was just copying everybody, any, any chance I could. I was like, oh, I have to do this. You know, I have to fall in line and, and, and do this sort of stuff if I want to be successful. And you didn't have that mindset at all, which got you, you know, to a, a point where your work really, I think, stands out in these spaces. Um, well, I mean, to be honest, so for like the first decade of tr me trying to be a professional artist, um, I feel like I was very much trying to find uh, niches that I could um, fit myself into. Um, I, I wasn't very independent minded in terms of like uh, having confidence in like, this is my personal voice. I, I think that I was very uncommitted. I think I, I was working in a bunch of different styles that uh, I thought maybe somebody could use, or I would see maybe this is an opportunity to make money. Let me see if I can like do that. But I think I was very much trying to be uh, what I thought different opportunities needed me to be without like fully committing to anything. Um, uh, because I sort of thought, well, I'll try all these different things. And then one of them eventually will, will work out. Um, I was interested in fantasy, but even so saying like that, I was trying to fit myself into opportunities. I didn't fit into, I still, cause I was always working in watercolor. I didn't fit into, um, like the game work that I was seeing, like at that time. Um, and then, but like, you know, I tried picture books and I didn't really fit in there either. So it's like, I was trying to fit into these existing opportunities. Um, but I was, uh, also not, not really a fit. But also not having the confidence to like have a personal, a fully personal voice. Um, and so it was like 10 years of like spinning my wheels kind of like that until I, um, until I discovered Alexcon and I started going to Alexcon um, and I had, you know, all these threads of different things I was doing and it was going there and seeing um, within that community that there were people who were sort of... Um, the traditional idea of what you would think of as fantasy art, but there were also people who were not that at all. Mm -hmm. um, and seeing people like, and talking to like people like Vanessa Lemon and like Bud Cook mm -hmm. and like Jody Fallon and being like, there are all these people here who seem to be under the umbrella of imaginative realism. They're like part of the fantasy community in some way, but they're not, you know, they're not like the era of like a, the sort of like established, like, uh, like magic, not, the gathering style of uh, not drawing dragons and orcs. <laughs> yeah. Uh, in a, in sort of a very realistic polished, um, digital or oil style. Like they have very much had their own voices that were a little more fine art, but like fantasy as well. Right. Because also the fine art world is not necessarily that welcoming to fantasy and horror. Mm -hmm. You're telling me. <laughs> um, and so I'm like, well, so there are these people who are doing this and there's a place for them. Um, and uh, it was at um, IX, like 2017, I think, um, that I showed a bunch of different things I was doing to some of those people. And there were, they like sort of honed in on the work at that point that I had started to develop that I think was the most me. Um, and that I was the best at and that I liked the best, but I'm like, I don't know what this work is for. 
I don't know how to sell this work. I don't know who wants this work. Uh, and they're like, yeah, but this is still the work you should be doing. Um, and I sort of took a leap of faith. And I, um, from that year onward, I sort of started throwing out everything that didn't fit that. And I got really focused in one direction. Um, cause like I had had all these things where I was making little bits of money, mm -hmm. but not really gaining any momentum from all these disparate things that I wasn't fully committed to and that weren't really working. Um, and I'm like, mm, I, you know, there's enough promise in this, in this work that feels the most to me and that I'm the most passionate about and that people are responding to like, let's go all in on that. Let's throw everything else out. Um, and let's see what happens. And like, that is what I feel like my real career started. Um, and when I started, um, building structures around selling that work and started doing conventions with that work and realizing that, that there are places where it fits. Um, and I think that that maybe that's a trend as well, even in, um, you know, in the past decade where, um, like magic has shifted from having very much like a single style to right. being more welcoming of, um, of different voices within fantasy. I would say that, that maybe that is a trend in fantasy in general, and maybe a trend also that more artists have figured out how to make like an independent, an independent way of selling their work directly to fans, both online and at shows. I think that's partly why that change happens, right? Because we, for the first time with social media, well, you know, it's been years, it's been what, <laughs> it's 15 years since Facebook. I think. Right. Anyway, but you get what I'm saying. It's for the first time you can look at artists who have maybe never taken into commission work and see, oh, they've got this massive following. People really love their work. And so it, it's sort of happening in reverse um, of these big brands saying, oh, well, let's get this artist to work for us instead of the other way around where the artist the makes their name. Corporations brand. are noticing, yeah, that this can sell and that it can, you know, they don't have to stick to that narrow mm -hmm. style gamut in order to, you know, improve the value of their brand. Yeah. So, I, I, and I like seeing that change. You know, I think and conventions are such an interesting space. Um, we've talked a lot about uh, how Bruce and I, I mean, have talked a lot about how having something that's so wildly different at a convention it, it it draws people in. I, I think about you. I think about Alan Panikal, especially uh, with his, his you, you never see work like his at a show. Um, mm -hmm. I think about, uh, what's his name? Dougie. Uh, Dougie right. Hops. There are a lot of, I mean, I would say at this point, um, I feel like half the artists are people that have, like, I, that I would think of as maybe having more, much more um, personal styles that, that, you don't necessarily think of as being like mainstream fantasy art. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think so. So what do you, um, what do you do when you're not at conventions? You, you just painting all day. That sounds fun. Um, gosh, that sounds nice. Um, I, you know, I don't, I don't know for, I don't do the number of conventions that, um, some people do and still it feels like, um, the business stuff takes up an awful lot of time, like the prep to do um, shows and like the prep to be able to release things and sell things online. Like it all, I think takes up, um, takes up a lot of time. So it's not just painting all day. Um, I always feel like I should be painting more than I am. <laughs> um, but so I have, um, I have a couple big conventions I do. I'm slowly, I've slowly been adding more shows, um, especially now that um, I have my husband helping me with shows mm -hmm. more. Um, so, and because shows seem to be the thing that is, that are um, working the best right, right. now as well. Um, and then, you know, online, the rest of the year, like online sales and online launches, you know, still is still substantial. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if it would work a hundred percent without the shows. Um, uh, and then some, some commission work as it comes, um, you know, when the opportunity presents itself, there's usually some, something every year, um, but not, you know, not constant freelance. Um, 
and uh once in a blue moon teaching uh teaching as well or like uh judging shows like within the watercolor society world which i also kind of have a foot in um so but boy it does seem to take an awful lot of time you know even even if you're just like selling work online um all the stuff that wraps around uh how to actually launch that work and present it to the world takes a lot of time yeah i did a pre-order for something um couple months back before it was released and then i probably spent a whole day just shipping out that pre-order when it finally came out and then you've got to make time to you know now you can just order the the guy to pick it up from your door the usps but like sometimes that doesn't happen so you have to make time to take everything <laughs> up to the usps uh anyway it, it's, uh, days like that make you want to hire a, an assistant or something you know um um, um, now I, now I have one technically. <laughs> um, yeah, my, my husband is my assistant now. Um, but, uh, it's even, it's hard to get somebody onboarded as an assistant too. Like all of the things that I, mm -hmm. I want to hand off to him. Um, it takes a lot of time to hand that stuff off to somebody to the point that they can like just run it themselves. Mm -hmm. I feel like we still haven't like succeeded at all of that handoff. It's been the same experience that I've had with my wife because i've been i think we did the exact same thing brought our <laughs> significant others on as as assistants and it's also finding like enough things that you can fully hand off to keep them busy right to to make use of of their time at least for for me i i find that sometimes um you know she's she's getting frustrated because she actually wants more stuff to do yeah that, that i can fully hand off without you know, um, having to, to sit over her shoulder the whole time to make sure it's done a certain way. Yeah, that's exactly what I run against. You know, I think Sarah, my wife, loves to help, and she does an outstanding job helping helping at shows, um, especially, but the behind-the-scenes stuff where you're packaging and shipping and all that is, um, it, it does take a little bit of looking over your shoulder. So... Yeah, I, I think I'm going to, I've got a, uh, I don't know, I, I was an assistant full-time, for well, not full-time, actually, but, but most of the time for Todd Lockwood for years, and I felt like I did a, a, a really good service for his business, while, while at the same time getting paid both a, a little monetarily, but mostly in, in experience and yeah. in, in art critiques. So I, I think I'm going to start aiming toward, you know, there's a local university uh, where I actually went to, and I think if I can get an art student on board, that would probably be the best bet for me. Someone who's really interested, because I think if you're interested in it, and not to say that my wife's not interested, uh, but someone who's got a drive for learning because they'll be doing it one day, uh, I think could be could be interesting too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know. and then you're not looking over their shoulder so often. But uh, anyway. What's so up with we, all this we, silence? Every time we stop <laughs> talking, it's just quiet. It's a terrible well, I, I was show. I was gonna ask on the on the same topic. So Joanna, which sorts of tasks have you had the the most uh, success offloading, and which ones have been oddly resistant? Um, well, so I would say the area where it, it's really been most helpful is that he's he's my teammate for doing the shows. Mm. Um, because when I, the first couple I did, I did totally by myself, which it was doable, but was not the easiest. Um, and so, and, and also like sort of booking some of the logistics for the shows too, like figuring out the, the lodging and, and mm -hmm. parking and all of that stuff. Um, but really just like having that steady help, like at the show itself with the, the load in and the setup and, and all of it um, as a reliable partner for that, because he's really good, like under stress um, in those kinds of situations. So like, that's been a huge one. And that's kind of how we've been able to ramp, start ramping up and adding uh, more shows. Mm -hmm. um, and then honestly, the other easiest handoff has been a lot of like domestic stuff. 
that uh, that I used to do when I was the one who was um, working full time from home. But since mm-hmm. I was home and not making as much as he was, I was handling a lot of that as well as my art business. And he's since taken over a lot of that, um, which is helpful. Um, and then like any errands related to the business, like dropping things off and picking things up is really helpful. Um, the stuff that I really wanted to hand off that I feel like we still haven't fully um, been able to do are like running my social media um, because it's a, it, he's not, uh, he doesn't do a lot of social media like on his own just mm-hmm. for recreation. And there's like a lot of, I feel like training of, um, you know, how, how each platform wants its own right. thing. Um, and, um, uh, he started taking on more like invent supply inventory um, and like he packages the prints and stuff, but I still make the prints because my um, systems make sense to no one, but me, but me. <laughs> and I have to fix them so that they, they make sense to somebody else. Um, and to be able to also just like fulfill all the online orders and stuff without guidance right. feels like it's sort of a big uh, transition. So do you have a big printer over there? Did you? Uh, I do. So you you made the commitment and got the like a big Epson or something. Um. So even from my early days, um, before like sort of the current era of my of my work, when I was just sort of figuring out different ways of making money as artists, I I had a small crappy printer, but I started making little prints of my work at the time to sell like on Etsy or to try to do like local art fairs or whatever. Um. And so I had that printer and I developed systems around it. Um, you know, that was like 18 years ago. And then through the years, because I had that system where it made sense to me that if I was making online sales, I would just print on demand and not have to like invest in a lot of stuff. Mm. Um, I would um, just over the years, I've kept upgrading the printer to better and larger printers um, so now I have one that does, um, 17 by 22. So it's not like gigantic. It's not like a floor model, large yeah. format printer, but it, it does do larger, um, limited editions. Um, and I, I, so I do it both to, um, fulfill orders on demand. Um, and then I do use it for convention stock as well. Um, I, I do wonder if at some point it might make that. sense to to not um to not be running all the prints myself for you cons sh- you should um i fought against it for years because uh todd lockwood had he had two printers he had you know the the massive like architecture style printer and then the smaller like powerhouse printers that can run you know supposedly quickly you know 13 by 19 prints is what we were doing and I think for, uh, cause he, he has so many prints, but it took like two, I don't know how it is for you. I think it takes almost two days of, of like reloading ink and paper into the thing to get a convention out of it. Um, yeah, it does take some time. And I would, I fought against it cause I was ordering prints from him and then considering buying my own printer. And then one day, like everything came to a head and I just buckled down and ordered prints one time. And then I, I've never looked back. I for the con- for the convention prints, not for the big prints, but for the mm-hmm. convention prints, I'm like, this is so much. This is so worth it to me. This is beyond worth it. <laughs> um, yeah. Um. I. I don't. I don't know. Um. I am kind of a control freak about like I. You know. I do, and I do my old scanning as well, and my own color correction, and then it's kind of like I. You know. I get exactly the print that I want. Um, and then it's nice too, because like you can customize quantities very easily and like, maybe you have your best sellers, but you want to try out a couple of some new stuff and you just make a couple or you just finish something right before the show and you want to bring a couple, right? Like I, it feels very convenient to do it myself. And I like the control that I have, um, over it, even though it does take time to make the, the bulk quantities. Um, so I don't know, I'm, I'm hesitant to move away from it but um but we'll see the control of the color uh is really what uh, hindered me from doing it for a while because i'm I, i'm very particular you know i've got uh what do you call it the, the little spider color corrector on my monitors 
things like that. And uh, so that way the prints are coming out 100% exactly. And I know what they're going to look like on every different program. At least I used to. And then, like, I'm not saying my prints look any worse. I can tell the difference. But nobody else can. And unless they're, you know, the blacks are all plugged up, I I don't have a problem uh, with people having the same wow effect. Um, it, it bothers me sometimes. But if I get a batch of prints where I really don't think it's been done well, one of the benefits I have is that I can call them or email mm -hmm. them, uh, my vendor, and say, hey, you know, these, I really don't like these. I'll send them a picture and they'll have them out to me and they usually rush ship them. So... I, no longer am I waking up after a night of, of the printer running to bad prints <laughs> because the black plugged up or something. <laughs> I don't miss that. But I, I'm not trying to, I don't know, I'm not trying to point you towards. <laughs> I would try it one time for one show that you maybe want to just, to, you know. Experiment. Experiment. and uh, I, I will take it under, under advisement. <laughs> yeah. So how long have we been doing that? How long? I, I'm supposed to be keeping up with the time. We're right at, we're very close to one hour. Is there anything else you wanted to uh, discuss? Anything you had, Bruce, a question? Or... No, my whole thing was, was trying to figure out this, uh, this uh, spouse assistant thing. So <laughs> <laughs> It's definitely helpful, but it's not as easy as I, as I thought it was going to yeah. be. Yeah. Um, and it it's uh this was like our first full year this past year I guess well it was mostly a full year um doing it and uh, I wasn't sure like how much it was going to boost our income having like a second people mm -hmm. a second person doing it with me and there was definitely a boost it wasn't quite as much of a boost as I um thought that there would be because mm -hmm. I guess there is really like an on ramp um to like getting somebody else sure. fully, uh, fully functional, but like so far, so far, so good. Um, and part of the boost is your own well being, rather than like a number that you can measure. Yeah, Especially it's certainly it a boost. It's certainly a boost in his well being, mm. um, too, because he didn't really want to be doing full time IT anymore. He mm -hmm. wanted to kind of early retire from that because it wasn't his passion. Um, he certainly enjoys having a more more flexible schedule. It's definitely a quality of life improvement. Um, you know, hopefully it works long term. He was definitely enjoying himself at Dragon Con. He kept coming by to <laughs> let me know how how things were going. He had I don't know like his white whale or something that he was chasing as far as which pieces of his uh, of yours that that you know um, he wanted to to sell and and <laughs> he was really getting into it. it was good. Uh, I think maybe we were waiting on um, there was a there's a collector um, mm. that in uh, 2022 bought my the the painting that's on my um banner mm -hmm. and the original of that not is not the size of the banner but it was a very large um, i remember piece. yeah let me see if it's in one of these there's the banner yeah so that's the um, yep. original hanging there um and a collector had bought that um at dragon con mm -hmm. in 2022 out of the the gallery bay in dragon con um and we were wondering if he was gonna come back I think was the, um, right, right. was the question. Um, and then, and he did, and he, he, he bought uh, the piece that I had in the Bay, mm -hmm. um, the following year too. So like, that's kind of the cool thing too, about like the momentum with the big shows is that there are repeat fans and mm -hmm. repeat, repeat collectors. Yeah. Yeah. I will say I just came, uh, from last weekend from uh planet city comic con. I think it's now just planet comic con. But, uh, I've never in whether Gen Con or Dragon Con, and I've, I've been to Gen Con the most, I've never had so many repeat customers as I did at my second year of Planet mm -hmm. Comic Con. There were just an unimaginable amount of people. And it's a massive show. I, I think it's got more vendors than Gen Con. It's huge. Yeah. Um, I've never had so many people come up and say, I, I saw I saw and I bought your stuff last year and I'd like to buy some more. And, and uh, not just the small collectors, but big collectors too. I sold more canvases there than I did at Gen Con. And I was like, wow, this is remarkable. That's awesome. 
Um, I've definitely, it, what a, one of my challenges has been um, figuring out, uh, because um, Gen Con and Dragon Con, I feel sort of like are their own animals mm. in, a, in a sense that they're fairly unique in um, the, that there's this balance of high volume print and merch sales and also collectors collectors interested in large originals, which make them really like magical um, the fin financially. Yeah. <laughs> um, and um, it's been um, trickier because we've been doing really well at those two shows, which I did sort of just kind of leap into. Um, and I feel like the ramp up has been pretty, pretty quick to um, making really big numbers at those shows. Um, but it is much harder finding um, th there doesn't seem to be anything else out there that is quite the same thing, you know, and I've sort of been slowly trying other shows to see like what feels like it's worth uh, doing for the, the time investment and the, mm -hmm. the money investment. Um, and always being, I guess, a little disappointed that no other show is quite as good um, as those two. Uh, but I certainly haven't tried every show, uh, you know, all over the country. So it's just right. this sort of like ongoing trial and error of like adding, um, adding, adding and subtracting here and there to see what makes sense. And needing to drive to shows does preclude you from a, at least a few West Coast shows that probably are comparable to, to Dragon Con and, and Gen Con. Um, there are, there are some I've been curious about on the West coast, but that is really the challenge because I feel like a lot of what I'm, I'm leaning on, um, you know, I do at those shows, I do volume print sales, but, um, uh, you know, a big chunk of my income is selling, uh, originals. Um, and, uh, even, even at some of the shows, like smaller shows I've done, um, where I'm not making as many original sales, um. I still feel like they're a big part of the display. I feel like at um, at shows that aren't going to be um, as big financially, um, they're still good advertising yeah. for the booth. And I feel like they're what bring people in and sell the prints, even mm -hmm. if the um, originals aren't going to sell. And so I don't, I have not yet flown to a show because I don't know how to make what I, what I'm doing uh, right. work. Uh, so like that, it feels like until I've totally exhausted, um, other options i probably won't take that leap that's where um, i'm at the that's why i struggle with flying to shows uh i feel like my work needs to be in that gallery setting uh large you know the larger format stuff really does sell it and, and banner i've tried banners and they just don't do both monetarily and, and eye-catching wise they just don't grab attention sure. as much as my framed canvas work and and I struggle with that. Uh, so when you figure it out, you got to let me know. I'm definitely <laughs> going to jump into flying to shows again. I'm not looking forward to it because I, I hated carrying a lot of stuff around, but I'm I'm going to lean on FedEx heavily. I've talked to, it's already been the theme of, of the last few months for me is talking to individual people about how they travel to shows. And it's all come down to getting things in and out of FedEx, which might be close by for some. and. Uh, yeah, I, think, uh, I don't know. I want to play with it. Um, yeah, I don't. I don't know the rates um, on shipping like large pieces safely. Just right. seem um, seem prohibitive. Uh, you know, maybe it's a little easier with um, like canvas prints. canvas prints yeah. or something that can all sort of be the same size nestled together like in a in a package or something right and they don't offer um, insurance on fine art uh, only up to a point oh so i have had just uh, as an aside i have had success with uh ship insurance through pirate ship um on actually honoring um insurance on fine art if it's been sold mm -hmm. which a lot of the other carriers won't do even mm -hmm. if it's sold work um, so that's good, but, um, but not for, if, it's, if it hasn't been sold yet, then no, like you can't, I can't insure it for the price that I would right. want to sell the piece for yeah. and expect them to, to honor that. So. Otherwise I just market a million dollars <laughs> and tear the box myself. <laughs> um, I mean, if the show was worth 
doing enough. You could potentially make like a, a couple week trip of it, maybe stop off at like a national park or something along the way, and you could potentially do a show like San Diego or Emerald City, perhaps. But we've um, um we've we've fantasized a little bit about or you know blue sky that concept of like well what if we did like a big show road trip and mm -hmm. we went out to the west coast to try to do like San Diego Comic Con or or something else or Monster Palooza or something mm -hmm. like that um it it it's becoming a more realistic thing we could do now you know we had well unfortunately we had an elderly dog until mm -hmm. january and we lost him which has been a tough time um but now that we, i think we'll probably not do pet life for a while which does mean we right. have more um flexibility and we, and we don't have kids so now yeah. there's not really anything stopping us and and mike isn't full-time employed somewhere else so we could just we could just go on the road and do like a, a road trip, like series of shows or like road trip out to a show. You know, I don't I don't know if it would be totally worth it financially to spend a week driving to uh, <laughs> to a show. But like it might be fun, I guess, if we turned it into like it's going to be both a marketing income thing and a vacation. Right. Yeah, there were. I mentioned it, uh, I think, last time I went to a smaller show here. And, and you know, like I do, I get around, I, I talk to everybody. And I was really surprised at the amount of people that uh, basically live their lives out of, um, for a few weeks out of the year, out of, you know, out of an RV. And mm -hmm. the RV is, is packed with all their inventory as well. And then they'll drag the RV behind them uh, while they're traveling in their vehicles or whatever. And, and that uh, it sounds appealing to me to do that for a little bit. I don't know if I would drive yeah. something like that all the way to Seattle. Uh, and also I think it could be a trap. I'm, I'm really good at, I'm really good at saying, Oh, that's a, that seems like a good idea. And then I'll, uh, you know, I'm the kind of person I'll go by the RV. I'll get really invested in like setting up the system for doing it. And then two years down the road, I'll be like, my life's miserable now. I don't want to live in this. <laughs> so. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, even just with doing, not even with living, a, but just doing a lot of conventions, the pace that I see some people keep with conventions sure. seems untenable to me, um, you know, which is. Which has been part of the um, part of the trial and error of trying to like get the most sort of bang for our buck out of um, key events uh, because I can't you know I I want at least a month in between any show that I'm doing especially in the in this era of like not actually post COVID where like you might get you might get sick at a show and not want to go immediately to another show. But even just energy wise, like, I don't, you know, I don't know. I feel like we're already, you know, we're entering middle age and um, I already have feelings sometimes of as much as I like the conventions of being like, Oh my God, we're like, I think we're already too old for, th <laughs> yeah. for this. Like we spent, we, 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 um, we spend a little more doing um, on, expenses for some of the shows we do too because i've quickly realized i cannot live in a hotel room with six people mm -hmm. i cannot <laughs> even if i even if i like them all right and so you know we spend a little more on um on lodging because i'm just not gonna sure. not gonna do that um that's where i'm at i at, at this point in my life i'm like uh no i'm not sharing rooms with anybody i'm not doing the airbnb i'm getting a nice comfortable room because the only usually for especially for shows that get out late you know you you have a time to get a bite to eat and then lay down and the place i lay down and wake up need to be be relatively comfortable for me uh because it's the only chance i have to recharge before the show you yeah talk about energy output i've got uh i don't know how some people do it i've got a friend he's a lot older than me he's an artist he uh he's doing like 16 shows this year you might know him. wow he's, uh, he's in this call <laughs> <laughs> not 16 Oh, it's not this year. Last year was fourteen. This year, I think it's like twelve. Oh, okay. And that's really maxing it for me. But the last I... couple of years, I I wanted to. I had a whole new thing to check out with the magic shows, so I needed to get a sense of 
what that whole scene is and which shows are worth doing and which ones are not. I was going to say, I don't know how you do that many shows and freelance at the same, <laughs> regularly at the same time. Oh, it's cocaine. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you didn't know this? Oh my God. <laughs> It's got to be. <laughs> um, I don't know. But, I, I make uh, art at the pace that makes sense for me. And the average piece is, I don't know, maybe like a, a week or two of work uh, for a typical freelance illustration. So that's that leaves plenty of time to, to get some shows in. But I, I did look at last year's uh, numbers of, of illustrations, and it felt like I was doing a lot less um, than I had um before the the recent ramp up in shows so there is mm -hmm. a cost there there is a, a balance to be struck yeah where do you think the bubble is there bruce like let's say I, let's hypothetically not bubble's probably the wrong word but hypothetically let's say you um stop getting all commission work tomorrow uh mm -hmm. you know wizards of the coast dries up um <laughs> they're they're totally taken over by by uh, ai they yeah and uh i don't know fantasy industry is topples so what how long do you think you keep making without making personal let's say you're in a vacuum now you can't make personal work you broke both sure. your hands. I'm, I'm living off of the things that i yeah. already made for various ips how long can you continue going to conventions and make the money you're making before uh you can't live any. You know, you can't make a living anymore. I think, think that I up? could. I mean, I think I could probably. Um, I could probably run that down for quite a while, but like the really good numbers would maybe lapse to to mediocre numbers, and then eventually to like survivable numbers. Um, over time. I mean, I haven't been doing this all that long. I've only been doing shows since 2017, and I've only been working professionally since like a year or so before that. So I feel like I lack the the long-term data set that I would need to actually determine how something like that goes. I've often wondered, um, you know, when when is the uh, Slay the Spire gravy train going to run out? Because that's been the item that's kind of set like a nice floor under my convention sales for for a while now and i mean i imagine i'll always be able to sell like enough stuff related to that that it's worth bringing at least some of them mm -hmm. but like at what point does it, it you know uh have or quarter the number of sales that i'm getting from it and i don't really know I imagine that it it will eventually happen. Um, you could become Larry. But I, <laughs> I mean, I would imagine though that if if you shifted into a different era of your work, right, where you where you weren't um, freelancing for like popular oh, yeah. IPs, that you would maybe become more focused on yeah. something that's personal, you know, per uh, personal. Um, either a personal IP or just a personal vision that might build its. I 100% I agree, uh, which is precisely why Alan didn't give me that option. I didn't give him the option. That's, that's where my mind um, was going. Is but like... that, that is 100% what I would do. I would be like, okay, we're just doing 100%, you know, 12 continents, my own personal IP thing that I've been working on. And and honestly, the, the freelance stuff has been um, reducing the amount of time that I would like to spend on that. Um, but it's always I've been keeping it alive on the back burner uh, with the kind of game plan of, OK, like we're kind of maxing the Watsi stuff for a period of time here. But I don't want to max that forever. And at some point it's going to be dialing that freelance stuff back either voluntarily or otherwise and um, making it about my own personal work. I think the personal work, I view it. Well. Not only am I, is it meaningful to me, you know, very meaningful, um, you know, I think often more times than my commission work, but it, it I, monetarily it acts as insurance against the commission work, right? Mm -hmm. um, if the commission stop coming in, I know that my personal voice will have a, a venue to 
to bring in income. Mm -hmm. And that's important. Yeah. That's, that's something I'm very envious of people like Joanna that you kind of just hit the ground running to do whatever direction speaks to you and, and make a living off of it. Uh, well, I mean, you know, it, I, it came, it came out of, yeah, I know. Like it came out of figuring out, um, for 10 years, what didn't work because, you know, it seemed, and it seemed like, um, you know, well, making all these other false starts, I was not um, able to be committed enough to any of them. And I was not able to really develop an identity as an artist. And that actually, I think in the present marketplace, um, what does work is, I think, uh, being sort of fully committed to whatever you're most passionate about um, in yep. terms of both subject matter and a style, whatever that that may be, not just because you think there's a demand for it or what somebody else wants from you, but because it comes from you first mm -hmm. and just fully committing to that. And then that's what the career actually grows out of, you know, both in terms of independent sales and potentially, you know, freelance opportunities. Yeah, I agree um, completely. I guess what I was getting at is, let's say, I don't know, a $5,000 commission from somewhere comes down the line. I, I could say no to it. I'm not going to. Uh, oh, I, I wouldn't say no. <laughs> I'm not saying to say no to anything. Not, um, not for you in particular. I'm saying like for me, it comes down the line, but I it, it might make me miserable to work on it when I would rather be doing my own stuff. Uh, I feel like you, you don't ever have to make that... Uh, call to wake up and, and not enjoy what you're working on that day? Um, I mean, so when it comes to considering like, uh, outside opportunities, um, and not having like, uh, wild goose chases, right. That sort of detract, um, from what you sh should, should be, uh, sort of focused on like for the long haul. Um, that, that has definitely been like a learning experience too, from, you know, those early, days. Um, and then now in terms of like, well, what to, you know, what makes sense to focus on that isn't just a uh, personally generated work and trying to, to sell that work. Um, and I have tried to articulate, I've articulated this to people a few times is that I think of it as like three different things. Um, you know how there is that sort of adage of like, uh, fast, cheap, um, good, um, pick two, um, that I have sort of my own uh, version of that, that kind of guides what I want to get involved in that I try to remember from time and time. And one is, do I get to do what I do? Like, do I get to do whatever I want, essentially, or something close to it? Like in my very personal voice, do I get to use that? Um, and um, two, does it pay um, extremely fairly or better? Um, and three, do I like the people I'm working with? And it, like, how is the experience of working with those people or that company? Because I realized that I'll, in the past, there are a lot of times that I felt like I felt obligated to chase any potential income, whatever it was, if, even if it was too low or if it was like the, the potential for income by chasing some opportunity that, that I wasn't like all in on. And I wasn't really like thinking about those things. Right. And so I like to have, you know, I feel like at least two of those things um, should be true. I mean, certainly at least one of those things should be true. I feel like in the past, sometimes none of those things were true of things that I was still um, like wasting time on um, because somebody asked me to do it and I felt like I had to or was supposed to. Um, so, I mean, that's kind of what it comes down to for me with. Um, you know, maybe with like a freelance opportunity is that I, I really want it to be in my personal voice and, and then also in my personal voice work that I can sell. Like if it's an original for a client that I can sell that original as well, or that maybe it fits into my body of prints, right? It's not work that I wouldn't ever do otherwise. Right. Um, and, um, you know, or maybe there are circumstances with for enough money once in a while, you know, I will still do something that is not part of my exactly current body of work. If they're fine to deal with and they're going to pay me really well, sometimes I will sure. do something just, you know, just for the money. 
I'm going to pitch this to you. This is a pitch I got, I think, two or three Gen Cons ago after the fact, you know, where everyone comes around and, and tells you, oh, I'm a publisher and I'd love to get your work or card or whatever. All right. I came up to this email offering me roughly, I think it was $3,000 for an Android. No, it's, it would be a, a cyborg goblin seen from below jumping off a steampunk plane uh, st- <laughs> while a, a full moon is in the background, I think being chased by like imps or something. And it was like, man, have you ever seen my work? All right, would you do that for $3,000 today? I'll Venmo. Would I do that for $3,000 today? Yeah. Um, I I don't think I could do that. Right. I think that's so <laughs> outside of like what I do that um, I don't, I don't think that that is enough for that because I'd be so bad at it uh-huh. um, to like actually be able to pull it off. I would, I would need a lot more money to convince me. And the lifetime value would be like zero after the fact. Right. Cause what am I going to, what am I going to do? Sure. I'm going to hate it. Like yeah. I'm not going to be able to do anything <laughs> with that. Um, and also the way that you described it, it just, uh, I get the smell of like nightmare client just <laughs> by the, just, just by the combination of, of elements. <laughs> I, I would say that I wouldn't do it, but I think I literally did like that type of a commission last year and maybe going forward would be less likely to, or at least I would up the, the price further. <laughs> I, I consistently, uh, <laughs> Saying every, it seems like every time I get to a point in my career where I I say keep saying no to clients, that's when the new opportunities arise. I mean, uh, I want to say that the I want to the week after I, I had a lot of authors I was working for, uh, and I was I, I was working for Grim Oak Press at the time. They they pay great. I love Grim Oak Press. Can't say enough. But then there are a lot of third party authors that were approaching me. No, they're not really third party that self publish like you know off Amazon right. and I, I was doing what I thought was really good work for them and the problem there is that maybe I I, I didn't realize what the future there held and so then I keep getting a lot of other authors reaching out to me and pretty you know before long I'm sitting around doing all these uh, lower than my normal budget book covers that that take a lot of time and you know, me and my wife sat down and I was like, yeah, I'm just going to cut all these out and it might hurt our budget for a while, but I think it'll make room for more clients. The week after I started saying no uh, and letting them know I'm not taking cover commissions anymore, um, Wizards of the Ghost reached out that, you know, I seemingly out of nowhere, but it's like I tripped and fell upward. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. I don't. I forgot why I brought that point up, but uh, saying yeah. no can be a good yeah, thing. Right? Yeah, yeah. Saying no to stuff that's like not yeah. quite, you know, when it comes to the value of of your time and your energy of like what it has to do be able to do for you, either financially or in terms of like the use of the work, otherwise, um, and the amount of hassle that it that it brings you. Um, and I mean, like self-publishing or sort of like indie people can be a real roll of the dice because some of them are night, you know, kind of nightmare clients and don't pay well. But once in a blue moon, you get somebody independent that will pay you a lot of money, um, like more than some of the mainstream publishers will. Right. Um, just depending on who they are and what their situation is. So, I mean, you just have to think about like what your, what your boundaries are, you know, I feel like, yeah. uh, Wizard, Wizards of the Coast, even being the um, the top tier of what a lot of like fantasy gaming pays, uh, you know, gets the benefit of um, their originals sell um, and yeah. that they bring their sort of own market of opportunities for um, artists that the artists could capitalize on in terms of like future signings or, or print sales yep. or whatever. Um, you know, when I when I got to do um D &D work for the first time recently um that ended up being like the payoff on that was selling the originals yeah um you live in my dream um, (laughs) well i mean i don't know because i haven't been contracted to do anything else for wizards of the of the coast i sort of thought that was going to be the door 
uh, opening. Um, and so far it has not resulted in a, in a flood of uh, additional work for wizards. I would, I would love to, you know, I would love to step into that magic, uh, magic, uh, train mm -hmm. of like, cause I, cause I do think, you know, I think that it, it, it opens additional opportunities, like what you've been doing with magic shows that, you know, if you, right. if you, you know, with signings and, and APs and things like that, that if you sort of capitalize on those opportunities, they are a nice additional income stream. For sure, yeah. And I guess the, the flip side of WotC kind of expanding their um, style gamut is that if you're kind of an outlier, it means you can get work with them, but it doesn't necessarily mean you're going to be getting regular work with yeah. them. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, still still fingers crossed hoping hoping that it might I mean you did you, you know, did good but... work for them. I'm sure they're going to keep you in mind I for so. for similar things. And I think definitely stuff of the right fit does come come up with them. Like I could definitely see more stuff um that would fit with your style and sensibilities. Um I could definitely see that happening again. So I I definitely wouldn't discount it even if they're not uh, immediately getting back to you with more stuff. Yeah, that'd be nice, you know. Um, you know, and I try. I know, you know. I think also though that the the advice to artists not to make any one client the end all be all is still good good mm -hmm. advice, especially when you know you never know what's happening. You know, the marketplace has its own own trends, and you know we've got all the stuff with AI and right. Who knows? You know what what may happen with any particular company that you that you want to work for. That um, you know, I think it's good to have sort of the stable um, branches of of what you do. Um, is the is the other thing that I think that I didn't didn't quite intentionally uh, do it, but over time realized that I've sort of built stability in terms of having mm -hmm. good systems for online sales that I've built over time as well as um, in-person shows, and then also some amount of freelance and um, client commissions. I do a lot of uh, portrait commissions for, for clients, which is something that I've done mm -hmm. for a long time that I did not throw out the window when I, when I threw out a lot of other stuff out the window because it just always worked, um, worked well for me. And so like I sort of have those different um, areas which all function together. Uh, you know, I wouldn't make a full living off of any single one of them. Um, but I mean, it sure was, you know, during the um, pandemic, you know, I wasn't totally reliant on shows. Um, I actually did pretty well when things pivoted yeah. to online sales because I already had those structures um, in place. Uh, so yeah having having multiple legs on your on the chair that your business is sitting on is is something i always advise it definitely worked out well for me in uh the pandemic uh for that reason and and even even with shows right like shows can disappear like anything that you're relying on can di can disappear so having um other options on the table and uh systems for those things worked out uh, marketing for those things worked out really puts you in a, a good position when when things have to pivot. Absolutely, working uh, working with Todd, it was it was such a genuine experience because he had you know I think over three hundred illustrations that he could sell prints of and a massive following and audience he had built up for you know over twenty years and so that was the first time that I saw the power of like a, an online store. You know, that's the real insurance. That's the real retirement for people like us who, who, uh, well, well, I do, but some people may not be contributing to their, like a 401k or an IRA type situation. You know, seeing that he was bringing in consistent income that way off work he had done years and years ago. I mean, that's, I think, the end goal. I mean, that's the closest we get to some sort of passive income, and that's the lifetime value in a nutshell. I do think, um, you know, one thing I've noticed um, is that what you do have to be doing if you're um, if you want to be in it for the long haul as an artist is that you and that is also the benefit, I think, of community um, as well, is that you do have to be watching and understanding how um, things are changing over time. 
uh, that even, you know, in the, in the early part of my career, that was that one of the other struggles of like not having a community and sort of graduating from art school and thinking like, okay, they taught me everything I needed to know. <laughs> Meanwhile, I'd been taught by, you know, mostly by people who knew how to do editorial illustration, you know, not, and, and I was entering an era where people were moving on to social media to promote themselves. And that was not part of my education at all. Right. Uh, I was taught, don't ever email art directors. Don't email them. Um, they don't want emails. Send them a leather-bound um, portfolio. <laughs> and it took me a while. It was it was connecting more to a community and not being afraid to kind of look at how other artists were, were doing things. Not just older artists, but younger artists, mm -hmm. too. Because often younger artists are the ones who are on sort of the pulse of, like, what's happening now. Yeah. Like what is the next thing for like how, how to promote yourself or like how to sell your work online or, you know, like things come, things come and go. Um, obviously your skill as an artist and your voice as an artist is the thing that is eternal for the, for the long haul, hopefully that will span your, your career if it's genuine, but then the, um, all of the different methods of how you make income from that work and and how technology is working around it, um, it's it, it's always changing. Um, that's a little scary, you know, because it's like you can't just be um, right. Sometimes there are old there are older artists who had a great career that you see struggling because even though they could be making work from or, or making money from their reputation or their work. They haven't tapped into the current ways of doing that because mm -hmm. they haven't. They're like, like, well, I can't learn a new way of of doing it. It's too hard. I don't want to do it. Right. Yeah. Like you have to like you have to. Um, That's probably something I, I think, should have pointed out is that, you know, that that the the income. Yeah. Me being Todd's assistant was a boon there. I I, I saw the potential tapped into the tapped yeah. into it and grew it. <laughs> grew it tenfold while I was there. It's not something that would have happened without me. And so that uh, would be another great reason to maybe in the future hire an assistant hire so you don't have assistant. to. Yep. Because when I'm, I mean, when I'm 70 something years old and have a portfolio that has that potential, I don't want to learn the new TikTok or whatever, you know, <laughs> uh, <laughs> four dimensional space we'll be living in. I, right. <laughs> uh, VR straight to your brain or, you know, whatever it ends up being. When we're living in the void, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah, okay, that's an hour and a half, and I have so many texts <laughs> I have to answer. I don't know what's going on, but uh, thanks uh, for being with us and carrying yeah. the show. Bruce and I are a little, little ill this week, so, you know. Well, I hope you guys feel better. Thanks for having me. I always enjoy talking about conventions and, and art business stuff. I think it's fun. That's why we're here is uh, yeah. we were always having these conversations and we wanted to just, ha it's a great excuse for, to just talk to people that we normally only see at shows because we're all yeah. in our goblin caves. <laughs> <laughs> Where do you want to Too point true. people? What do you have going on? Oh, uh, well, Joanna Barnum.com is, is the place with everything for sale and all the other social medias are, um, are linked from there. Mm. And I have a list of events there of the conventions that you will find me at upcoming. Um, I will be at, uh, Gen Con for sure. I guess we don't know about Dragon Con yet. I hope I'll be at Dragon Con. Um, yeah. uh, I will have a piece at the, uh, Mitchell museum at the, in the, um, the, uh, illustration invitational show there, Nice. in Denver this summer that um that Elliot Lang put together um I'm excited about that that's kind of what I'm finishing up that's right great. now so I have that info on my website uh I'm on all of the social medias I think at this point even though I wish I wasn't <laughs> so you can you can uh find me there I either as Joanna Barnum or Joanna Barnum Art depending on the on the platform you should be able to find me um uh, and I have a newsletter on my website. I didn't talk about newsletters. I feel like all of the um, the time recently where I've done sort of like business advice chats with other artists have just been me yelling at people that they have to have a newsletter. Like start it. If you didn't start it yet, start it now. <laughs> oh, yeah. Have a newsletter. The newsletter is pretty powerful. 
It is. I thought that is the best thing I did for my, I started for my business a number of years ago and sort of invested in it as a, as a re, like religious routine that anytime, you know, that I was adding people to the newsletter, every show, having it on my website, anytime I have something new, it goes out through the newsletter. It's not an afterthought. Like it's the first thing. Um, and over, it takes a lot of time for it to grow, but, um, then it becomes very worthwhile. So. Yeah, I do the same thing whenever I have something new, also, which which can be rare these days because all my stuff is either you know a series that's unfinished or NDA. So I, I envy. That's another thing I envy you. Just <laughs> you finish something, you throw out in the world, you make money. I gotta wait years for this stuff. <laughs> um, newsletters, yeah. Do you do you have the what the uh, what do they call it a drip campaign or do you do it all manually? No, I haven't really gotten into that like advanced stuff, right? Where you have like the series of newsletters that go to new people. Mm -hmm. Like I, it's really just the fact, like you just have to, ha like you have to have it and you have to use it. Right. Um, it's just, you know, I, it's just that I, I just send an email anytime I have something new for sale. It's really that simple. Like I don't mm -hmm. really make it super complicated, but, and, and I always add people to it after a show. Like I don't avoid adding the the names. I do it immediately. Mm -hmm. um, and I have it linked from everywhere for people to sign up for. So I know there's all this super advanced newsletter, um, like funnels and all. I don't even, I don't even know what the marketing lingo is. I don't do advanced stuff, but it's just the routine around having it and using it. Mm -hmm. That's probably the next thing that we need our, our young assistants to help us with <laughs> the advanced newsletter stuff. That's true. <laughs> but I mean, I think it helps in that if you're an artist, right, the art is the content. Sure. So you, it, you're you showing, a, you know, a new piece of yeah. art or a new product or whatever. So it's not like if you're selling, I don't know, uh, something abstract, right, where and you have to figure out how to make that into an interesting newsletter mm. like it's a very concrete thing like here's sure. the art like this is what you're here to see for here's the art here's where you can buy it here's how much it costs that is true yeah. we have the the incredible benefit of uh just sort of like the thing we sell is the content we create uh, we don't have to do a lot of commercials or you know go out and take nice pictures of our candles um, <laughs> yeah, it's not like finding a bunch of uh, r new creative ways to market the same like thing. the same th the same thing. Yeah, I should. We should do that though. We <laughs> should try. <laughs> that would be funny. Um, okay, I think that's it. I th All right. I, I like the newsletter. Uh, we are probably not going to schedule anybody for an interview next time when Bruce and I are feeling better. I think we're going to do a, a, well, not really solo, a Bruce and Alan show where we just kind of hang out and talk like we normally do off camera. Um, but we were playing with the idea of taking questions. If you're listening to this and you have some questions you want to throw out for us about conventions, technique, uh, hair product, uh, lack of hair product, anything, uh, <laughs> we will do our best to answer it. And if we don't get, we'll, we'll post on social media, but if we don't get any questions, we're just going to, we're going to riff. It's going to be a good time. Just going to shoot the shit, huh? The hat. Oh my God. I just realized you're not wearing your hat. <laughs> Yeah, that is the the unfortunate thing. I I should probably get like uh, fancy earbuds that sit in my ears and allow me to wear the signature hat. It just occurred <laughs> to me. I'm like, oh my god, oh my god. Join our GoFundMe. I'm, I'm free of my <laughs> parasite boss. <laughs> we'll start for a little a, while. We'll start a GoFundMe for AirPods for Bruce. <laughs> <laughs> um. All right. Yeah. Again, it, it won't be as fun without joining here. But uh, thanks. Thanks for joining us. All right. Night, guys. All right. Night.